Welcome to Fat Chicks on Top. This podcast contains frank discussions about the body, sexuality, and occasionally uses swear words, which may not be appropriate for people under the age of 18. This podcast also uses facts, statistics, and mathematics, which may not be appropriate for liberal arts majors. And this podcast relies on science and reality, which may not be appropriate for evangelicals. back to Fat Chicks on Top. You're here with your host, Auntie Vice. It's great to be back. I am here today with Rachel Kramer Bustle. She is editor extraordinaire. I've worked with her in that capacity. She's an erotic writer, a journalist. Uh, she's come out as a hoarder on Salon. She covers politics. She does all, all the things with writing. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I know it can be hard to kind of summarize what I do because I do fiction, nonfiction, like I've written sex columns about my sex life and journalism and erotica. So I kind of do a little of everything. You you write about so much. And so one of my questions is, where do you find the inspiration and drive to produce as much as you do? Because you're incredibly productive. Thank you. I mean, I think this is something I've only really figured out in the last few years, and I'm 47, so my mid-40s. I mean, I think some of it has to do with ADHD. Like, I will, I don't, my work days are each different, so I'll set out in the morning to accomplish X, Y, and Z, and then often get distracted and do ABC because, you know, I'm, I just follow my interests, and so sometimes I really have to rein it in, and like, I have article ideas I want to pitch, but I save them for three or four weeks down the road while I catch up on other stuff. So I really just, you know, go with what is most pressing to me and most urgent and most interesting. And that's in some ways how I got into erotica. I was in law school at the time and thought I was going to be a lawyer. And I was very young. I was 20 when I started law school. I had started reading erotica in college. So like 18, 19. And before that, I had read romance and Daniel Steele and stuff like that, but I had never read explicit erotica. And so I was exposed to it in college and I just found it in haunting bookstores. And I was like, this is very intriguing. And that was when I was, you know, having sex for the first time and exploring. And then in college, I was exploring lots of other sexual things like sex parties. And so really my discovery of erotica coincided with discovering a lot about my own sexuality and just the world of sexuality. So that was a natural fit in one way, but in another way it wasn't because I'd always been a writer of letters to the editor and essays, but nonfiction. And so erotica was the first fiction I ever wrote aside from, you know, you're a kid, you're writing like little kid fiction. And it just, I don't know, it, it felt right. And, but I was never someone who thought, Oh, I'm going to write the great American novel. I just thought, wow, I'm reading all these erotic short stories. I'm going to try to write my own. And I did that in 1999 with a story called Monica and Me that was in a book called Starfucker, edited by Shar Rednauer, who had had a zine of the same name, which I hadn't read the zine because I hadn't heard of it. But I found out that she was editing this book. I, I forget where I saw it, but she had a call out for stories. And I sent one in and it got accepted. It's funny because my memory is, you know, kind of iffy about a lot of things in life. But that was it probably got accepted in 1999 to come out in 2000. And I remember that so clearly because it was so exciting to me. It was like, oh my goodness, my first erotica story and it's going to be published in a book. And then I also submitted the story to Best Lesbian Erotica 2001 because they accepted reprints. And it turned out that came out first before Starfucker. So that story got in two books. And I think just that early success really made me feel like I'm going to keep trying to do this, but there was no set plan. Like I'm going to leave law school and become an erotica writer and editor and write sex columns. Like it all, I mean, looking back, it seems like amazing. Like that was 
the path I was supposed to be on. But at the time, I had no idea what I was doing. And I was flailing in law school, and it just really was not the right fit for me. I was interested in the topics intellectually, but I didn't really understand what being a lawyer would entail. And I just, uh, the more I discovered it, the more I was like, I don't think this is a good fit for me. So long story short, I, you know, I gradually transitioned. I left law school. I, you know, had day jobs and I was writing on the side. And then I, in 2004, I got asked to write my village voice column. And then I got asked to apply for a job at Penthouse Variations. And so I became an editor there. My career in sexuality and sex writing really, and erotica writing and editing just evolved from pretty much that first story because even then I was in in law school, I was writing for the NYU paper, but a column about just, you know, things in the news like op-eds. So so I, I was never writing about sex until I got immersed in this world of erotica. And like I said, for me, that was really part of my personal journey too. I was discovering that I was bisexual and at the time kinky. And I was just curious about this wider world of sex that even though I've been in the Bay Area for college in Berkeley, I hadn't explored it there. Like I didn't know what was happening beyond my little campus, pretty vanilla world. And so it was exciting. And then as a journalist, I was able to do all sorts of things like go to porn sets and and just people were confiding all sorts of things in me. And I think that as a people person, I'm kind of an introvert, but I also really am fascinated by people. Like I'll be somewhere, you know, waiting for a bus or a plane and I'll just look at people and try to think about what their lives are like and I'll eavesdrop. That's been such an honor to have people share aspects of their life with me that they don't share with other people. And that could be about sex. You also mentioned I've written about my own hoarding. People have definitely confided in me about their hoarding. And there's a lot of topics in our society, I think, that we're so immersed in shame about that it's hard to escape it, even if you're, especially sex, even if you're totally sex positive and you don't, you wouldn't actively say, I think that the shame is how we should live. Like, it's still probably in you somewhere because of just the way our society is still set up. And so it's not that I don't sometimes feel like, wow, I don't love that I could walk out the door and my neighbors, if they Googled me, would know all these things about me. But writing is always how I've processed my life. And when I was a teenager, I wrote about things that I went through, things that I went through with my family. And you know, there's there's pros and cons. It's not something I would recommend to everyone. And that's why with fiction, you know, I tell people to really think about what name you want to use, because once you use your real name, you might think, oh, it's just in this one little book. Well, your name's going to be on library sites and it might be in reviews. I mean, you you can't say, oh, well, no one's ever going to see this. Like, if you really don't want someone to see it, they will probably see it. So, So for me, though, it's been very cathartic because once you do put it out there, you you can't take it back. And it's sort of freeing because you've done this thing and said this thing and it's okay. Like the world didn't end. And yes, maybe you get intrusive questions or maybe you get, you know, spammy, like creepy emails once in a while. I mean, luck, luckily that's all the worst that I've gotten you know, it's something I balance even now with social media. Like sometimes I'm sharing things and my family members are calling me like, are you okay? You said you had to, you know, do this thing. And, you know, even when I don't intend to share things, like two years ago, I had a miscarriage and I was not really planning to discuss it on social media. But at the same time, that was during the pandemic. It was a very lonely time. And I I think I said I went to the ER and then eventually I shared that. And, you know, so many people reached out to me that had been through similar things. And for me, that's really the most gratifying part of sharing my life. It's not to be an exhibitionist per se, which I also don't think, I think being an exhibitionist gets such a um, bum rap. Like it, it's not so much look at me. It's I went through this thing and I want to share it because we're all human. And you know, I, as a reader, I read lots of memoir, I read lots of essays, and I learned so much about humanity from them, because I think people write in ways that they don't 
necessarily talk. Like I would definitely write things in an essay that I might tell my partner that I went through it, but I wouldn't say it in the exact same way because I don't think we speak in the same way we write. You 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 do a different kind of like deep dive. And I think the same goes for erotica. It's really a chance for people to explore fantasies and maybe things they've experienced or want to experience in a way that they can be detailed in a way that I don't even know if you're detailed always in that way with a partner. Like you might say, okay, I want you to spank me. Just take an interest that I've had. But I think in an erotica story or book, you have more room to really elaborate on what that means and just look at it in a different way. And that's why I think, like I always say, when I get bored with editing erotica, I'll stop. And I haven't gotten bored since I first edited an anthology in 2004. And I wouldn't say I got bored, but I definitely slowed down my own writing because I had written so much and I felt like, okay, I don't know if I want to be writing my own book of short stories, you know, or coming up with new stuff all the time. But I love the creative energy of authors who bring such different experiences to the table. And I've worked with over 700 authors, close to 800 in over 70 anthologies. And it's still an exciting experience. It's it's exciting on several levels, like cre- the creative word part of it. It's really thrilling just to take an idea I have and then see how people interpret it. And then, you know, I feel like I'm giving back to authors in the way that Shar Rednauer and Tristan Taramino, who edited Best Loves Minerotica 2001, did for me. Like, I'm giving a lot of authors either their first experience being published or, you know, one of their first or or even if it's their umpteenth. But, you know, like that is always exciting for me because that helped me break into this industry. And I would love to be able to do that for other people. You bring up so much. So I'm going to kind of tease out some of the threads that you've touched on. You you know, you're like a number of other writers we've had on the show who process their world through writing. So as you got deeper into your own erotic writing, how did it change your relationship with your own body? That's a really good question. You know, I think writing erotica, it helped me kind of figure out which experiences were ex- especially impactful because Definitely in my 20s, I I had a lot of sex with a a lot of people. And some of it was amazing and like life changing and wonderful. And some of it was just kind of like, okay, I did that next, you know, like some of it wasn't. And for me, like, I don't, I'm not in the moment of having sex with someone and thinking, okay, I'm going to write about this. I think sometimes that's the perception, especially because I was a sex columnist also. Like, I, I don't go through anything in my life where I'm like in the moment, like, how am I going to process this on paper? It's more after the fact, oh, wow, that was like really wild. Like, and there's something I, I know I wrote an essay about this and I can't remember if I wrote erotica about this, but I was, I had a layover at an airport and I think it was overnight. And instead of getting a hotel room, I just stayed there. And there was this guy who was in the same position. I forget what country he was from. He was from another country. He spoke some English and we had this tryst like in the airport and it was hot and crazy. And, you know, I wrote about it because why not? It's such a like juicy story. And I, I truly do think in a lot of cases in my life anyway, like truth has been stranger than fiction or truth has been things I used as fodder for my fiction. I think both writing and editing erotica have made me more open to different kinds of sexuality, both things that maybe I wanted to explore or just wanted to fantasize about. And it made it feel like, okay, that's okay. Like I don't have to feel awkward about it. But it also, I I think just being aware of that wider world of sexuality beyond my own personal interests has made me, I don't know if that's affected my, my relationship with my body, but it's definitely made me, I think, a better person because it's shown me that sex, the way our culture thinks of it certainly is just so narrow and there's so much more to it. Like people are turned on by all kinds of things, some of which I understand intuitively and some of which like I don't understand logically, but 
I'm fascinated by. And, and I also like just I can respect someone's sexual interest as long as it's consensual. I don't have to like get it on an intimate level. Like I can still respect it. And that's as valid as anything else. And and I think the more you dig into sexuality and the more you just talk to people beyond maybe even your inner circle, the more anyone will see that sex is so vast and desire certainly is so vast. And I think that's where erotica really can give readers that similar sense of community and just acceptance because, you know, you can find yourself in erotica, whether you're turned on by, you know, aliens and dragons or I don't know, like food play or whatever it is you can find it. And I mean, you might have to dig a little if it's a little more um, niche, but you will find it or you can write your own. And I think a lot of authors like me come to erotica from a place of their own sexual curiosity or having gone through sexual experiences that they want to, you know, immortalize or, or, you know, I, I don't think, I think it's sort of a myth that everyone's writing like verbatim their own experiences, but I think for a lot of authors that their work is informed by at least something in their background. It might not be so clear cut as I did this. And then I wrote about this. It might be, I did this. And then I totally put that in a blender and like, you know, it might be unrecognizable to anyone else, but you know, if it's really informed by your life. And like, as an editor, I don't, I don't care if it's informed by your life or not. Like, you don't have to say like, I did this. So I know it's real. Cause it really, all that matters, I think to the reader is that it feels real on the page. And you've had the, the joy and the task of reading thousands of erotic stories and doing you know, 70 plus volumes of erotica. What has been some of the stuff that has been most surprising to you in reading what reader or what other writers have submitted? That's a good question too. I need a second to think about it. Um, I don't. Um, you know, I think what surprised me, what what always surprises me, is when authors can come up with something that I could sit at my computer for like a month straight. I mean, if, if I was just at my computer, like from when I wake up to when I go to bed for a whole month, I would never in a million years come up with the things that they write about. Cause it just, my mind doesn't work that way. And it's like, um, there's a story that I think is in best women's erotica of the year, volume seven gravity. And it's about uh, gravity play in this futuristic like, brothel. And it's really fascinating and it's hot, but there's also like there's sex work and there's multiple partners and there's gravity and there's just a lot going on. And like, that's the kind of story that like, I'm always interested in. I don't really read sci-fi in my personal reading. I have like once or twice, but just my mind is much more linear. So like stories like that, um, and, and really any kind of sci-fi or futuristic paranormal, like those always su surprise me, but also like delight me in a way, because I know I can never write them. And I feel like as an editor, if someone sends me something that I would never be able to write just because I don't know how to, or I, I wouldn't gravitate towards that, uh -huh. um, uh, that that's something that like it will stand out for me. What do you see as, as the gaps in the current erotic writing landscape? Where, where do we need to fill in with more stories that are just missing or people that are missing or acts that are missing? I mean, you can definitely find this in, you know, online, but I do think it's not the majority. Um, submissive men, like, I, I think you do find femdom, and it's often from the dominant woman's point of view. And I'm femdom, I, in this case, I mean, like, dominant women, submissive man, but I don't think there's as many novels or stories, and I certainly don't get them submitted to me as much for short stories from the perspective of submissive men. Often, if I do get those kind of BDSM stories, it's from the dominant women's perspective. And I'm, I'm always interested in that. I also don't get as many stories just from the perspective of dominance, which that you can find elsewhere. But um, in, in like what comes into me, I get a lot in the kinky world, I get a lot of submissive 
points of view, a lot of submissive women with men. And that's not to say I don't publish those stories, but definitely I think there's a lot of space left for the perspective of dominant characters who who get off on you know giving erotic pain. And I think that's much harder to describe. It's a lot easier to do justice to someone who wants to receive that kind of pain because because I think that like you can describe what that feeling is like. And then I think it's much cha- more challenging to describe the dominance point of view because, you know, they could just come off as cruel and, you know, like abusive. And the erotic writer's job is to to talk about like why it's not, why it's part of a kinky play and, and it's an exchange of power and pain and, you know, you're, you're giving something they want and also getting off on it. But I think that getting off on giving someone pain is, is a really interesting space to explore. Like I think in life, like I would love to read more essays also by people from that perspective. And you don't see that as often. You still see a a fair number of coming out essays as submissive, especially by women. And I totally understand why, because our culture tells us like, you're not a good feminist. If you like, to be kinky in that way. And, and especially like the more so-called degradation you like, the, the more I think that can be an internal conflict. But I don't think we hear as much from this women who or men who, who are on the other side of that equation. So that's something I think I'd like to see. I also think I'd like to see more like unusual fetishes, like and by unusual, I just mean less common, you know, and I don't even have a, it's not like I sit there with a wish list of, I want to see these kinds of fetishes, but just, you know, I see a lot of foot fetishes. I see, I see kind of relatively like common, more common ones. And I think that there's just such a whole world of fetishes out there. And, you know, you can Google like top most common fetishes and find lots of articles. And I think those are fascinating. I mean, and I think if you have one of those finding other people who share that is really important just to know that you're not alone. But if you're creating fiction, I like, I'd love to read fiction just about someone with a fetish I'd never even heard of, or that maybe isn't, doesn't really, I mean, I don't know if doesn't exist is the right word because it probably exists somewhere, but you know, just like an unusual fetish or just something that is off the beaten path. That is the kind of stuff I like to see. And yeah, people people often ask me, okay, I've read your guidelines and I see what you say you're looking for, but like, what are you really looking for? Like, what else do you want to see? Like, what's the secret code that I can write to get in your books? And I don't have one, you know, I there is none. And I don't go in with a preconceived idea of like, I want this, 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 and this. Although that being said, if for right now, I'm editing an anthology of uh, flash fiction in 1,000 to 1,200 words. There's no theme beyond that. You know, if if I start getting submissions and I like uh, like 20 stories, but they're all from a certain perspective. Like, let's say they were all from submissive women's perspective, whether they're with men, women, or people of other genders. Like, at a certain point, I would say, okay, like, I, I might update the call and say, I actually have enough from this perspective, send me other things. So, so really I'm just looking for variety. Like, and I'm, I'm always looking to work with new authors that either are, you know, haven't been published in erotica or that I haven't worked with, or that are in the early stages of their uh, careers, because they're, you know, I, I think that's something I feel is, is important for the genre and important for readers. And just, as I said, to give back, but Beyond that, I'm just looking for good, like good, which is, of course, subjective. Like, I think it's something really important for any writer of any kind of work is don't get discouraged if an editor or 10 editors or 20, 30, 50 editors reject your work. I mean, look at it. If if 50 editors reject your work, you definitely look at it and maybe workshop it and have a beta reader or have a writing group. But that you hear all the time about people getting book deals and they've been rejected multiple times. I think it's such a, there's so many factors that go into it. So with my my anthologies, I might reject a story, not because I didn't like it or find it interesting or sexy, but because I either am at my word count or I might have stories that are just too similar in a way that I feel it would not be a good 
fit for my readers. So I've had cases where I had two mermaid stories that I really liked for a given book, but if I only had 20 slots, like two out of 20 is a lot of mermaids. Yeah, if you're really into mermaids, you'd be fine with that. But for general readers, I want them to feel like they're getting 20 or however many totally different stories. So often when I reject stories, it's for a reason like that, that someone submitting could never predict. And rejection is just part of the writing process. Like, you, to be a writer, I think you have to be really okay with being rejected a lot. I mean, I think it's a paradox because I get rejected and I'm a human being. Like, I'm never like, oh, yeah, rejection. Like, I mean, of course you are inclined to take it personally or to be like, oh, well, what's wrong with this piece? Um, I think there has been a kind of a, a movement away from that where this there's this 100 rejections kind of movement mm-hmm. where people try to rack up 100 rejections in a year and you know I think if you set a goal of okay I want it, it doesn't have to be 100 but if you aim for a certain number of rejections that means just by the numbers if you're sending out this many pitches or stories or whatever you're probably going to get some accepted and I, I think it's an interesting way to look at it and I'm in some Facebook groups about rejection where people like post their rejections and then get cheered on or someone might say, okay, you got rejected from this place, submit it here. It, you you just have to, like you said, like keep going and, you know, think about what worked or didn't work with your, your piece. And I often have a second, especially for like essays and articles, I have a second outlet in mind lined up in my head. I might even make a note in my spreadsheet. So like if I, when I get the rejection, if I get the rejection, I have it ready to go. So yeah, I mean, and just, I can tell you, I get probably, probably between like 150 to 200 stories. And for most of my anthologies and I have room, you know, in the flash fiction, I have room for 69 and best women's erotic. I have room for 20 to 25, depending on the word counts. So even if let's say I get a hundred and, what is it? 69 times two is 138. Like I'll probably get at least double the amount that I need. Uh, So I'm going to have to reject half just purely on the numbers, even if I loved all 138. So there's just some of some elements of just you're not going to get accepted every time. I don't. And I don't think there's any writer who gets accepted every time. So you just have to, you know, push through that and also just try other markets too. There's lots of outlets for erotica and there's also places like uh, myerotica.com, which is a publication online. And there's other, uh, that one is right now hosted on medium.com. There's other ways you can get your erotica in front of people. And especially now versus when I started in 1999, when, uh, you know, there wasn't social media and there there weren't as many non-traditional outlets. It was mostly maybe it was zines, print magazines and books. But now there's so many places and they're self-publishing. I don't think there's only one path to success. And I don't I think that especially for any any kind of writer, really nonfiction fiction, you kind of have to think about what your goals are. Like, is it is it to make money? Is it to get your name out there? Is it to be published by a certain publisher. And, you know, you can pursue those strategically that they may overlap, like your, your path to fulfilling those may overlap, but it may be different depending on what those, those goals are. So I don't think you can take rejection personally, because then it, then you're so focused on the rejection, you're less focused on the creative aspects of writing. And just by the nature of it, you're going to re- get rejected. And I have to say, you send out the nicest rejection letters to your volumes. Thank you. I hate, I mean, honestly, I hate sending them. It, it, I find it like physically painful. I really don't like doing it because I know what it's like to receive them. And I know that I'm usually sending dozens at a time. And I don't, I mean, it's a kind of a form letter but I try to write to everyone personally instead of a mass email and it it, I don't enjoy it like I'm a person too and I'm a writer and I don't I don't like relish it um but I try to be encouraging and I if I can like if I have another anthology lined up I will say you know I couldn't use it in this but feel free to submit to this I, I mean I will say I'm likely taking a break from anthologies after the two I'm editing this year I don't know if that'll be like a year or two years or what I just like I have a lot of other projects that I want to focus on. And even though 
I kind of have the anthology process streamlined. It's a pretty time consuming process. I'm reading every essay that comes in, selecting them. And then just, there's a lot of maneuvering. There's actually a lot of math involved. People don't realize, but you know, if I have, like if I, my word count is around 70,000 words for my book, some a little over or under, but if that's the case, I could have 14, 5,000 word stories, or if, if they're 3,000 words, that's 23. You know, I, I have to play around with the way the stories come in that I like and how they play out. And I always err on the side of trying to include more authors. But then if the, I've up, sometimes I've said 4,000 is the maximum for sometimes I'll say 5,000. So, so a lot of it is math and trying to figure out how to kind of get as many authors who, who fit together, you know, who make sense to go together into a given book. You mean it as an editor and as a publisher, what our needs are different than necessarily when you're writing as an author. Yeah. And that's why I, I mean, definitely like if you're submitting to my books, you have to meet my guidelines, but I think if you're writing I would definitely encourage people to write first and then edit later. For instance, I'm doing this book of flash fiction. The stories are a thousand to 1200 words. For some writers, that's just not feasible. They're like, I need 1200 words just to set the scene. So, okay, that book is not for you. Like, don't, unless you want to do it as a challenge to yourself, like, don't feel like you should, you know, truncate what you're trying to say to fit that. I mean, not every outlet is for everyone. So, and for some people, they're like, oh, that's great. It, it's a good um, challenge. And and yes, you can tell a good story in that short word count. And I know it's, it's funny because for readers, a lot of them feel like, oh, that's too short. And yes, it's very short. The idea is just they're five minute reads. Like they're very short reads and they're, I'm giving you variety, 69 stories. I'm not trying to get you totally invested in these characters who you'll know everything about in 1200 words. They're, they're snippets, but they are more than just a sex scene. Like they are actual stories that have a beginning and middle end. They're just short, but you know, just as some readers don't like short stories and only want to read like novel length, some people are the opposite and want just some, or maybe some people don't have a lot of time to read erotica or listen to it. They just want something quick, but you know, there's one isn't better than the other. Uh, there, there's no, it's all subjective. So if you write long, like write long and then find a publisher who wants your hundred thousand word book or, or self-publish it. Like, I don't think you should ever try to, um, I mean, yes, if you have a goal for a certain publisher and they only take their maximum is 50,000 words, don't send them a hundred thousand words or, or send them to 50,000 words that work standalone. You know, I think you're right that creating art and, and, you know, creating writing is, is a different act than submitting writing. And it's a different thing for me as an editor to edit than to write. And I have to give props to people who can do flash fiction. That is so not me. As somebody who turned in a 723-page dissertation. Wow. That's amazing. I can't even conceptualize but, that. How long did it take you? Like four years. Wow. But yeah, no, I, I consistently write long. The idea of a thousand-word blog post is difficult for me. So I have amazing respect for people who can be that succinct and get a good story. I love reading those stories because it's so not something I can do. Um, yeah. Which I mean, is why yeah. I love the short story anthologies. Yeah, I mean, and I think like, you know, a short story anthology is trying to do a different thing mm -hmm. than a novel. Like a novel, you're immersed in that world and you're spending several hours, however long it takes you to read or listen to it, like with these characters and you feel like you know them pretty well. A short story you know, you might know a little about the characters, but it's more like a snapshot of their life, like maybe one day or one slice of their life, you're not getting as broad of a picture. But also, I don't think they're in opposition, because sometimes people write me short stories for my books that are about characters who are from a novel, um, you know, that they have an extra scene, or they have an idea in mind, and people can read them both. Or like, outside of my books, you know, you see a lot of authors with like outtakes, maybe on their websites, or as a bonus material or a bonus story, you know, I, I think I would imagine I haven't written a full length novel, but I would imagine if you do, you, you, the characters stay with you. So I think sometimes it's, it's a welcome opportunity for authors to 
you know, later, later on, go back to their characters and give us like something new about them. And I, I always love that because as a reader, when I finish a book that I really liked, I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to know more, which is why I think a lot of people like this series, especially in romance and erotic, erotic romance. There are a lot of series and in erotica, mm-hmm. people like to follow the characters and kind of get the, what happens after the, the, the end, you know, they want to know like more about them because they enjoyed spending time with them. Exactly. Exactly. You also work in nonfiction. You have a background in law and journalism. Erotica deals a lot with fantasy. And right now, in reality, bodies are under attack. Where have you been focused in nonfiction? You know, what are your concerns with what's going on right now um, in the world? Because there's so many ways bodies are under attack. It's funny because, honestly, one of the first things that came to mind, it might be a little off topic of what you're thinking about because you know what's happening post Roe v. Wade is just Mm -hmm. really horrible on so so many levels I mean the fact that people can't get abortions but also that miscarriage care and just care health care are being decimated and 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 the fact that we're supposed to be the United States of America but the care you get really depends on what state you're in I just think is such a travesty I'm, I feel lucky that I live in New Jersey, but it also feels kind of like not guilty, but it, it's kind of, it's totally wrong that I live in New Jersey and I can get a certain level of care. And if you live in Texas or one of these other states um, with these um, anti-abortion laws, you you can't get that level of care. And that anyway, it, that, I think that's awful. But honestly, what just came to mind because it, I've been researching this is, I mean, our minds are part of our bodies and mm-hmm. What's happening in Florida with these book bans and books being pulled out of school libraries, and it's happening in other states. Other states are taking cues from Florida, and DeSantis wants to become president. You know, I think the fact that we're telling children that they shouldn't be reading is just such a a symbol of what is wrong with a lot of the right. Um, I don't, I mean, yes, there are some parents who have read these books, and when you read the complaints, it's very often about either sexuality or race. And they, you know, between the two, you know, they don't want kids learning that someone might not be straight and they don't want them, they don't want them learning that our country was built on slavery. I mean, those are just facts. There's people who aren't straight and there's also people who are, you know, non-binary or transgender. Those are also, that's also a fact. And our country was built on slavery and, taking land from Native Americans, also a fact. Like, I just, I'm not quite clear on what they think these books are doing that is so, I mean, I, I I am clear on it, but it's also just, to me, it's horrifying that they're not just saying, I don't want my kid to be allowed to read this book from the school or the school library. They're saying the whole school, the whole district, the whole state, et cetera, should not have access to it. Um, And it's ironic too, because in some cases they're blowing up the book in the media so much that these books then get reached lots more people. But I, I do think that's an important point to make that the right wants to attack knowledge. They're also, I mean, and it goes back to reproductive care too. They don't want information shared about how to do self medicated abortions or, you know, they're, they're going after any method they can to get what they want. And I think, you know, information, it it all does start with information because without that, I mean, you're going to have people trying to give themselves abortions in ways that could kill them or hurt them. So, you know, I think we need to share credible, knowledgeable information um, that in in legal ways or knowledgeably risk. Uh, I'm not saying we should always stick to the law, but I mean, if you are going to flout the law, like I think you need to be aware of the risk, especially if you're bringing someone else into that. So just the, the scope of some of these laws, I mean, I could go on and on because, I mean, you can be you can be charged for. I, I think in Texas or some of these states, you can be charged for giving someone information about how to access care. And I mean, that that to me is just such a huge reach. I'm not saying it's OK to go after the person getting the care, but like the, the web of how many people can be touched by these laws is quite large and very disturbing. I mean, I mean, it's much worse than it than I had actually, I guess, thought it was going to be so. And and I think there's a link between the the book bannings and the attempts to 
impede the work of teachers, of nurses, of doctors, of a lot of professionals. You know, what they're, they're basically saying, we know better than you do. And that's ludicrous. It is. And the the blocking basic access to knowledge and information is, I come from a background of academia, is just horrifying. I would, and I would hope it's horrifying to any teacher, like in some ways, I know that our country is so politically divided that people are willing to go along with things, even if it's almost against their own, whatever interests and just to get what they want. But I would hope that any teacher, regardless of where you stand on these issues would, would be offended. And I mean, teacher from, you know, pre-K on up to academia, college level, like would be horrified that we're trying to make students less smart, like less literate, like what? Like, like this thing happening with the African-American AP history course, you know, the college board took what DeSantis wanted and made that a national policy. I mean, it's very scary. And the fact that I think not just that DeSantis wants to run, that's scary, but that he thinks that that's a winning strategy. I think that yeah. says a lot about our country. And thankfully, there are people fighting back against that. There's a Florida Freedom to Read, definitely worth following because they're, they're mostly moms on the ground in Florida tracking these book bans and working with schools and teachers and school districts. But, you know, just... I think it does start with this trying to um, uh, shrink down knowledge. And I mean, that's something you see happening in countries that are not democracies, that don't have the First Amendment, that don't have the safeguards we're supposed to have here. So the fact that they're trying to make that happen here and are succeeding in some states is just horrifying. And this, I, I put this plug in a lot of my shows because some schools will ban novel or just not necessarily banned, but just not buy them. You can always write your local library and request a book in that library. Then gives people access. I, I'm a huge library fan. I think they can be really revolutionary. So request these books in your local library, and they oh, can definitely. Add them to oh, them. that was that's another category of people that you know that what they're doing to librarians and like librarians could be charged with felonies for doing their job. I mean, their job is not to like what's the word um inculcate or uh, right. know, radicalize students like that's how it's being made out that teachers and librarians are like trying to make students think a certain way like to me the job of an educator or a librarian is not to tell someone how to think it's to give them access to tools books and other media that that they can use to think for themselves and like if you don't want kids or adults to think for themselves there's something seriously wrong with you so what have been some of the more influential books you have read to you personally? Well, in the sexuality sphere, definitely Susie Bright. Um, hers were the Best American Erotica series and the Her Erotica series, which uh, had various editors, were some of the earliest erotica I read. And the Virgin Territory 1 and 2 were edited by Shara Rednauer, were some of the first erotica books I read. And those those I reread. And in the nonfiction, also Susie Bright, her essay collections and um, Real Life Nude Girl by Carol Queen, you know, those really helped me figure out a lot of things about my sexuality. And then, gosh, it's so funny. I read so much all the time that like, I and I have some books that I go back to, but like I'm always torn. Like, do I reread a book or do I read a new book? But there is a novel that I really love. It's not erotica, but it has some of the most moving and creative around language that I, I'm, I'm trying to say, like creative language around writing. And I'm totally mangling that sentence. But it, the book is called The Concise Chinese English Dictionary for Lovers. I'm not actually sure how to say the author's name, even though I mention it all the time. Um, the author's name is X-I-A-O-L-U, and then the last name is G-U-O. And it is about a woman who moves from rural China to London, and she is learning English throughout the book. So at the very beginning, the book is in English, you know, the version I read. It's broken English. Like, it's it's kind of hard to read because she, you know, her, she doesn't know that much English, and she learns a new word every chapter. And there's a, there's several like erotic or sex scenes that I think are erotic. And there's one where she's at a 
I don't know if it's a strip club or like a, a strip show. And she's talking about watching these performers. And it's so interesting the way she describes it. I, I'm pretty sure she says like flower to mean, you know, this woman's anatomy. Um, and if, if an American writing a, a contemporary wrote that about, you know, I would say, oh, well, that's, that's a weird euphemism, like say word that someone would actually use. But in this case, that is a word that this character would actually use. And it's just done so well. And it's, and, and like everything is about the book is about her, um, getting used to this new culture and, you know, sort of fitting in or not fitting in and discovering sex and relationships. And that, that book I really enjoyed. And there's a book called Addition by Tony Jordan, also just a, a regular fiction book, not a romance or erotica, but it's about a woman with severe OCD who starts to overcome it through a relationship. And the way intimacy is woven into that novel also that those are both ones I've reread. And, and I think, I think you can learn a lot about sex from erotica, but also from sex in other forms. And that's good and bad. Like those were, I would say good examples of sex writing, but I think you can learn a lot about what not to do from the, you know, like the bad sex and fiction awards, um, which I think they're on hiatus, but, you know, some of those descriptions are quite uh, over the top. And in 2021, I do want to put in a plug. I worked with this website, the good bits on the good sex awards. And if you go to goodsexawards.com, um, you can read those winning entries and the finalists. Uh, we only did it that one year, but that was kind of our way of offering an antidote to the bad sex and fiction awards. And, and, you know, what was interesting is there, there was flash fiction on there. There, there was a whole category for that. Um, there, there were all kinds of stories that a lot of them were self-published or were published on journals or websites that are not mainstream. You know, my books, right, I've worked with other publishers, but the majority of my books are with Cleus Press, which is a small press. Um, and there's, you know, there's erotica out from the mainstream houses, from smaller presses, but there's a lot of indie self-published work and work that you know, you might have to seek out a little more, but it's worth looking at and finding those outlets too, especially if you're interested in a certain aspect of sexuality that isn't as mainstream. Um, and the Good Sex Awards, I did go through and I read most of the the winners and some of the finalists you guys selected a great group of writers it was so, really it was challenging there were so many i mean i wasn't that we had judges who like narrowed it down and then we were mm -hmm. you know involved in some of it but there, we got so many amazing submissions and what was interesting to me is that you know i'm immersed in this world i'm reading hundreds of erotica stories a year for my anthologies but there were a lot of authors that i had never heard of who were entering the awards and I've been really lucky. I've gotten to work with a few of them since then on my anthologies. And, you know, there, there's always new people entering the world of erotica. And one thing I loved when I started and that I still love today is that it's very open and democratic and in the sense that you don't need an MFA, you don't need any kind of degree, you don't need any experience either with writing or, or with sex, really. I mean, as long as you can tell a good mm -hmm. story, and I'm always looking to work with new authors. I don't care if you've never written anything before. Um, if your story is something that I find intriguing, like I'll accept it. So I really hope that's encouraging to people who are on the fence or who feel like, you know, oh, I'm not as good as this person. And I hear it even, I teach erotica writing classes, which I haven't worked out the whole schedule for the year, but I will be teaching them about once or twice a month. So you can find that on my website. Uh, rachelkramerbussell.com but um you know people will sometimes some people will want to read their stuff to the class and then other people are like oh well mine isn't as good as those other people and it's not you know it's not a competition even if you know you're both submitting to the same editor or something everyone has a different style and I don't think you should ever try to consciously make yourself sound like someone else unless you're you know you can learn from people and you can use techniques that they use. But, you know, I, I think that's the beauty of humanity and the beauty of writing across any genres, fiction, nonfiction, you know, that we each bring something unique and special to it. And that's, that's why I still am editing anthologies, um, because I want to find those new 
stories and voices that I haven't read before and that hopefully readers haven't read before and are and are like drawn to. If our readers want to, our listeners want to find you, they want to read your work, they want to connect with you, they want to take your class, plug all the things. Okay, so my website is rachelkramerbustle.com. Uh, my newsletter is on Substack, rachelkramerbustle.substack.com. I'm most active on Twitter at Raquelita, R-A-Q-U-E-L-I-T-A. And I'm on Instagram, Rachel Kramer Bustle. And I do try to update all those things as often as I can. I try to give writing tips on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, I'm, and I'm, I do teach erotica writing classes and I'm, I'm teaching a new essay writing class. I'm aiming to teach each of those at least once a month. The dates will probably change. And I may, t- I, I have on my list for the year to try to teach a class on how to edit anthologies. Obviously, I know how, but it's very different. Like, that's another thing. People are like, oh, those who can't do teach, but teaching these things and doing them is totally different. So for the anthology one, like I, I've been working on that for a few years and it's, it's really about like backtracking of all the steps that are so second nature to me, like writing them all down and trying to synthesize them so I can explain them because there's things that come up that I just forget about because I just sort of am like, oh yeah, let me do this thing. But it, it's much more time consuming. I'll, I'll just say that it's it, there's more involved than you would think. It's not just okay, read these, select them, you know, say yes and say no, and then you've got a book. Like there's there's a lot more steps. Thank you, and we will have all of those links on our our site and in our show notes for readers, along with the books that you've mentioned. Thank you for giving me a reading list for the next couple of weeks, and uh, thanks for being on the show. Don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. <laughs> Hi, this is your host, Auntie Vice. Are you curious of finding other podcasts with a similar sense of humor and topic? You can check out To All the Men I've Tolerated Before, which is one of the most awesome titles out there for a podcast. It covers issues of misogyny, everyday misogyny, dating, period stigma, and all the fun things the rest of us have to deal with when interacting with men. Set your players to check out for all the men I've tolerated before. And thanks for listening to Fat Chicks on Top. And now, a moment of gratitude. This is kind of sappy, but I'm really grateful for my boyfriend. Um, We've been together for just over 11 years. And like before him, the longest relationship I'd been in was for almost a year, but not even quite a year. So definitely learned a lot in those 11 years. And I still learn things about him and about us and about myself every day. And he is much more private than I am. He's an abstract artist. So that is how he expresses himself. And he doesn't even like to title his paintings like he does now, because he's displaying them and they need a name. But um, yes, there's well, this is a podcast, but there is one right behind me. I mean, there's abstract art all over our house. Uh, whereas I'm much more literal and I'm like, oh, I'm going to write an essay about this very minute, the thing that might seem minute in my, in our lives, but like that I can't stop thinking. of. <laughs> so I, I think it's probably hard to live with someone and be in love with someone who writes about their life. I don't envy him necessarily or anyone who's partnered with a writer who is not that way themselves because I I know that it can be weird and I know it can be weird for other like family members or friends like like oh you know why are you writing about this but again like for me that's just how I process things and the fact that he I, I I do often ask him like are you okay with me writing about this if it involves him and he's never said to me don't write about this I mean I know it's not his way and I know he he maybe doesn't love it, but he, he never tries to censor me on that. I'm just super grateful for, because I think I'll always be a writer of some kind. Like that's just, it's not even, even when I'm hopefully if I live to whatever 90, like I'll probably still want to be writing about my life because that's just what, how I naturally express myself.
thank you for listening to this episode of Fat Chicks on Top. Please like, subscribe, and review our podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on. If we like your review, we may even read it online. This has been an Auntie Vice production. Producer and host, Rebecca Blanton. Audio production by Sharon Smith. Music by David Manga. And more music by Sharon Smith. For more information about Fat Chicks on Top, please visit our website for all things Fat Chicks at fatchicksontop.com.